<laughs> and I'd like to invite Joel to come forward, please, and to do a reading for us from the Torah and then the Brit Hadasha. Thank you. Okay, the first reading is uh, from the Torah, Genesis 18, verses 1 to 8. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed to himself to the earth and said, O oh Lord, if I found favour in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three sears of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. The second reading is from the Brit Kadashah, the new covenant, if I've mispronounced that, Lawrence. Very good. Excellent. <laughs> Uh, this is from John 15, thir verse 13 to 17. No one has greater love than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I am no longer calling you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. Now I have called you friends, because everything I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I selected you so that you would go and produce fruit, and your fruit would remain. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. These things I command you so that you may love one another. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate that. And so this week's uh, Torah portion is called Vayera, and it comes from the beginning. Uh, the very first word of our portion from Genesis chapter 18, verse 1. Vayera elav Adonai belonei mamre vehu yoshev petach haohel kechom hayom. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. So today's parasha teaches us that at various times we may employ three different postures before the Lord. We may run, we may bow, and we also may stand at various times, just like Avraham Avinu, our father Abraham. So in our relationship with the Lord, there may be times when we will want to be running into his presence or be running to do his will in, his, in our lives. There'll be times when we bow down to him in worship and then there are times that we will stand before the Lord. We'll find all this in this week's parasha and it begins with a, a very interesting story from the life of Abraham. Abraham is having a rest under the Elone, the Elone Mamre, the uh, oaks of Mamre. That's a type of turbinth tree, and I think I've got a picture of a turbinth tree probably down in the Negev, very much in the area where Abraham lived. His tent must have been in the shade of the tree as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. Then the Torah tells us that the Lord appeared to him there together with two other men. Our Torah text tells us, and the Lord, that is yud Hey vav Hey, appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre. 
Now, we are trained to read the words yud, or the letters yud hey vav hey as Adonai. But it actually doesn't say Adonai. It actually says yud hey vav hey. And this is the ineffable name of God, or the Tetragrammaton, as it's also known. All we have in the Hebrew is yud hey vav hey, and actually we have very little knowledge of how to pronounce that name. The pronunci pronunciation of that name was lost even around 200 years before the time of Yeshua. And so we have come up with a, a few guesses as to how we pronounce that name. Of course, the popular one was Jehovah. We've all heard of Jehovah. And I'm sure you've also heard of another variation, Yahweh. Yahweh. Now, we're not really sure which one is right or if any of them are close or not. And we won't know until God fully reveals the pronunciation of this name sometime in the future. So we have come up with a few guesses. And so we, we have to be careful also how we use God's name. Don't use it in a flippant way. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain, it says in the commandments. So be careful how you use the name. And so, of course, you'll find that uh, Jewish people are very careful about using the name and will never use the name Yahweh or uh, any other variation. Sometimes we'll just say Adonai or Hashem, or even when they write God, they don't write God, G-O-D. Even in English, they write G-Dashti. I think that's going a little bit too far, in my personal opinion. But the idea is to be careful of how we use the name of the Lord. Now, it's very interesting that, the, that there are three men that appear to Abraham, and these three men are identified as the Lord. Now, this could have been an appearance of the angel of the Lord together with two other angels. We are first introduced to the angel of the Lord back in a few chapters back in Genesis 16, verse 7, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Hagar, that's Abraham's concubine, and after she had actually been chased out of the house by Sarah, God appeared to her and promised to look after her and her children. And so it's very interesting to study the angel of the Lord throughout Scripture. Literally, it's the angel of Yahweh, or the angel of yud Hey vav Hey. The angel of the Lord is identified with Yahweh in a number of passages in the Torah, like Genesis 16, verse 13, Genesis 22, 11 to 12, that wonderful passage where Abraham almost about, was about to kill his son Isaac, and a number of other passages that you can see there. And also there's a number of passages from the Haftarah, from the prophets, or the Nevi'im, if you like, Judges 6 and 11, and other such stories where the angel of the Lord seems to be God himself, because they speak to him as if he is God. And yet the angel of the Lord is also distinct from Yahweh in several passages in the Torah and the prophets. And you can see some references there, Genesis 24-7, 2 Samuel 24-16, etc. Thus, we believe that the angel of the Lord may be an appearance of the pre-incarnate Messiah. Pre-incarnate Messiah. And there's a number of interesting stories that you can look up where the angel of the Lord appears, and it seems that it could be the pre-incarnate Messiah. What's the pre-incarnate Messiah? That's the appearance of the Son of God, or the Word of God, or the Messiah, before he became flesh and came to dwell with us on earth. And so that's a very interesting study to have at another time, when you have more time. It's absolutely amazing to see how Abraham, in the heat of the day, and who knows how hot it is in the Negev, or anywhere around Israel in those areas there, how he jumps up in the heat of the, of the day, he, come, he comes up from his very comfortable position, and he runs to the visitors. Runs to the visitors. Yes, he runs to the Lord. Do you know that Abraham is 100 years old at this time? Sarah, 99 years old. And so it's amazing. Not only that, there's something very interesting that one commentator uh, brings forth, and he says 
that Abraham at this time was still recovering from being circumcised. And they say, it, he says it was on the third day, the most painful day. Because if you look back in Genesis 17, it's all about Abraham and uh, all uh, his family being circumcised, or at least the men, of course, and the servants, all being circumcised. And so it's quite likely that Abraham is still recovering at this point. And uh, yet, even though he's recovering, he jumps up and he runs to the Lord. So what a wonderful example to us of someone who even at 100 years old is so enthusiastic to be in the presence of the Lord. Abraham then pleads with them to stay and he offers them water to wash their feet and most likely he washed their feet himself. He offers them food and they agree so he quickly goes to Sarah and tells her to bake some bread. He then also runs to the flock and chooses the best little lamb to be slaughtered and prepared for them to eat. Here again we see him running to do God's will. Again, what a wonderful example for us. May we be as eager and enthusiastic to do God's will in our lives. And then he serves them curds and milk together with lamb on the spit. Sounds amazing. I would love to have some of that. But it's not kosher according to rabbinic tradition. That's very interesting. Curds, milk, and meat. Milk and meat. Well, I don't know exactly how the rabbis answer that. We can look that up sometime. I didn't have time. But here we have Abraham watched the Lord and the two angels eat that. <laughs> he goes and he gets this bread and he serves them lunch and they sit under the oaks as a shade. Now, whether he knew his visitors were divine or not, we can't be sure. Although I do think that he knows that he's entertaining the divine. But it, isn't, uh, it is rather amazing, of course, the kind of hospitality that Abraham shows to the visitors. This is certainly in contrast to the later in the story when the angels go to Sodom and Gomorrah and they find it very inhospitable and that the evil citizens of Sodom do not welcome them, in fact, want to do them harm. Abraham's legendary hospitality even gets a mention in the Brit Chadashah in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, I think referring to this very story, says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for there, thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Isn't that lovely? This will also be a reminder to us all that hospitality is a very special gift, very powerful gift, and we are all encouraged to show hospitality to one another and to practice hospitality without grumbling or complaining. Don't complain about doing the dishes afterwards. And if you go and eat at somebody's house, offer to do the dishes. Let us take a leaf out of Abraham's book and let's be intentional about showing hospitality to one another. Romans 12, 13 says, Contribute to the needs of the, saint, the saints and seek to show hospitality. And we in Celebrate Messiah are in the process of reinvigorating the ministry called Zularu. Zularu uh, is a ministry of hosting Israelis. In New Zealand, where the word Zula was first uh, introduced to this kind of ministry, Zula is not those people who run around with spears and uh, loincloths. That's Zulu. Zula is a, uh, a Hebrew, Arab, Arabic word, Slang word meaning a comfortable place. And so in New Zealand, our ministry, Celebrate Messiah, started a Zula Lodge that welcomed Israelis as they were traveling and became very popular. And also now has another lodge up on uh, the west coast. And we started a ministry called Zula Ru. That's the Australian version of it. And uh, we're right now in the, uh, in the process of reinvigorating that, opening up uh, uh, online and also with apps to have hosts from around the country, have Israelis come and stay in your home, and for Israelis to be able to find those hosts. So I hope you'd want to be part of that as we roll that out in the next few months. So keep your ears uh, open about that, your hearts open, that you might show hospitality to Israelis. 
that they may find a comfortable place in your home as they travel around Australia. The story of Abraham's hospitality is also a lesson to us about the intimacy that Abraham enjoyed with the Lord. The fact that the Lord did indeed tarry with Abraham under the oak trees and eat with Abraham conveys this intimate fellowship that they had between each other. Eating together in the Bible is always a picture of intimacy, of peace, and of covenants that were often made in that way. Not only did Abraham run to meet with the Lord, but he also prostrated himself before the Lord. And it says in Genesis 18, verse 2 to 3, When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the earth and said, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. The fact that Abraham refers to the men, or at least maybe the one man as Adonai, seems to indicate that he did recognize the Lord and bowed before him in honor and worship. And that too should be our posture in our relationship with the Lord. We bow towards him and we bow before him in his presence to worship him. And of course a lot of songs all talk about bowing before the Lord. We said that a number of times even in our songs and our prayers today. And this is also why throughout scripture Abraham is always called God's friend. Several passages talk about Abraham being a friend of God. As the prophet Isaiah says, But you, O Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. It's lovely that God calls Abraham my friend. There's no other person in the Bible called God's friend in this way. However, as followers and as lovers of the Messiah of Israel, we are also called friends of God. And that wonderful passage that we had read, no one has greater love than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, the Messiah says. If you do what I command you, I am no longer calling you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. Now I have called you friends, because everything I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Oh, that's comforting, isn't it? I selected you so that you would go and produce fruit, and your fruit will remain. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. These things I command you so that you may love one another. So it's a very comforting passage for us where the Messiah calls us his friends. He reminds us that he chose us. We might have said yes to him at some stage in our lives, but he chose us in the first place. And he chose us for a purpose, that we might produce fruit in our lives, that we might do good. As uh, Rabbi Shaul also says, that we are God's workmanship created in the Messiah to do good deeds. So we are called to do good in this world through the Messiah. Now what is our response to the Messiah's choosing us? He says, go produce fruit that will remain and that you should love one another. Then your prayers will be answered. It seems quite simple. When God appeared to Abraham, Abraham got up, ran to him, bowed down, and then he prostrated himself before the Lord. But Rabbi Rusnik says in his Torah commentary, he points out that there was another posture that Abraham takes before the Lord later in the story. In this case, Abraham doesn't bow before the Lord, but he stands before the Lord. Let's read further on in verses 16 to 22. Then the men set out from there. They looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to see them, to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Seeing that Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said to him, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done so whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood 
before the Lord. So after the Lord confirms the promises to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant that we looked at last week, the three men go on from there, and Abraham, and then of course Abraham stands before the Lord. So two men go on from there, the Lord stays behind. Abraham goes a distance with them, but just before they part, Abraham tries to lure, sorry, the Lord tries to lure Abraham in. Should I tell Abraham a secret? You know what it's like when somebody tries to do that to you? And I know you're curious type. You would say, yes, I would like to know a secret. <laughs> Sometimes I say, no, thanks. <laughs> Don't tell me something that's a secret. But Abraham uh, is lured by the Lord into this. God says, should I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Should I tell Abraham the secret? And Abraham is hooked. God then reveals his plans to judge Sodom and Gomorrah for their great sin. The outcry and of their depravity of these two cities was so great that the Lord himself had to come down to see. This is where we see Abraham's posture change before the Lord. Previously he had run into the Lord's presence. Previously he had run to do God's will. He had bowed down in worship before the Lord, but now he stands before the Lord in intercession. He stands to argue with God on behalf of the, the, the citizens of these two great cities. He stands to intercede on their behalf. God and Abraham enter into a process of bargaining. That is quite similar to the haggling that takes place at those shuks in Jerusalem when you're trying to buy something from the Arab shuk uh, and you have to bargain them down. Like a good old Arab merchant in the old city, Abraham bargains God down. Abraham says, suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep, sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? This tradition of arguing with God is, I think, a very healthy tradition in actual fact. We see uh, that lovely story of Fiddle on the Roof with Pivia the Milkman arguing with God on several occasions in the story in a very kind of loving way, but he certainly does have uh, an argument with God on several occasions. The one occasion, of course, he's, he says, why did you have to choose us? Can't you at another time choose somebody else? Or why did you have to let my horse go lame just before the Sabbath? That wasn't nice, he says to God. And he had a few things to say about God giving him his wife. But he had a great... Our relationship with God and arguing with God is a biblical thing to do. And here we see Abraham bargaining God down. And I, think, I actually think that God wanted him to do that. Abraham is looking after God's reputation after all. He says, far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? What a wonderful passage that is that answers a lot of questions uh, for us when we don't understand some of the things that happen on the earth. We know that God is a righteous judge. And so Abraham bargains for the lives of those in Sodom and Gomorrah, even, the most, even though they are very wicked and even though they actually deserve God's judgment. Abraham bargains God, uh, God down all the way to a minion of people, that is, ten men. Ten men. God's, Abraham says, if ten men are found in the city, will you still judge that city? So even in Sodom, Abraham wants righteousness to be done. And he wants God's reputation as a righteous judge not to be lost even in the evil city like Sodom. And as it turns out, despite Lot and his family living there, it seems that God couldn't find ten righteous people in Sodom because fire and brimstone did come down before the Lord and rained upon the cities. But Lot and, of course, his family were spared. So, dear friends, we live in a world where there is a lot of sin. Sin is so great in this world we can only imagine what the Lord has to see from heaven on a daily basis in the world. Imagine being able to see God 
uh, from, uh, from God's vantage point, see all the sin that's happening in the world all at the same time. It's horrific to even think about. Surely the outcry of the evil in this world has come up towards God for God's judgment. So what kind of posture should we take? Well, I believe we should be like Abraham who stands before the Lord as an intercessor for this world. I think that all too often, we too are too quick to call down God's judgment upon this world with fire and brimstone. Rabbi Shaul says to the Roman believers, he says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same thing. So yes, of course, the world deserves God's judgment. And yet, we also need to remember that we too are sinners. All of us, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, it says later in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 23. And Rabbi Raznik says that when we take the posture of an intercessor, we identify ourselves as sinners rather than standing afar off as self-righteous people. This is the posture of all intercessors in the Bible. Remember Moses, who interceded on behalf of his people when they had worshipped the golden calf, put his own life on the line. Remember people like Nehemiah, who interceded for the people of Israel, admitting his own sinfulness and the sinfulness of his own family and the people of Israel as he confessed their sins before the Lord. Or like Daniel, who interceded for his people on the basis of God's mercy and grace, not on the people's righteousness. These are others who have interceded. Now, we should not have to make excuses for the sin of this world or argue that God doesn't have the right to judge because he does. But no, we realize that this world is actually on a precipice of God's judgment. And in fact, we don't have a leg to stand on. We deserve God's judgment. But that doesn't mean that we should stand afar off and distance ourselves from our fellow humanity. No, we should stand before the Lord in intercession, appealing to God for mercy and appealing to God to withhold his judgment. You know that mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. We need both mercy and grace in our lives, and we find both in Yeshua the Messiah. In Yeshua, God shows us his mercy by withholding the punishment that we deserve from God for our sin. Instead, Yeshua is punished on our behalf. In Yeshua, God shows us his grace in giving us what we don't deserve, and that is his love, his favor, and his forgiveness. That's why Rabbi Shul says later in Romans, but God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Messiah died for us. How much more then, having now been set right by his blood, shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were yet sinners, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also boast in God through our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We receive reconciliation from God. We are called to give reconciliation to others. Since we have received so much, let us be the first in the world to reach out to those around us in love. Let us show care for the stranger, as Abraham did. Let us also show care for the marginalized, the outcast, and even as we heard from Nicole, the disabled. Let us be like our Messiah, Yeshua, who reached out and touched those who were sinners, those who were lepers, those who were outcasts, and then let us be like Avinu or Avraham Avinu, our father Abraham, who was a friend of God. Let's pray. Avinu Malkeinu, our father and our king, we come to you and we ask that you would 
Forgive us, Lord, of our sin, of our unrighteousness. Forgive us when we have judged others while we ourselves are doing the same thing. Help us, Lord, to love those around us. Help us to stand and intercede for the world around us. Sometimes we call down judgment and we take joy when it seems that judgment is meted out. But Lord, we pray that you give us hearts that are merciful, hearts that are gracious, because we ourselves have received so much love, forgiveness, grace, and mercy from you. Lord, help us to live righteously as Abraham did, even as Noah did in his generation. But let us also stand as intercessors, that, Lord, we might be able to be mediators of your love and your grace to the world around us, as you have called us to be ambassadors of the gospel. So, Lord, I pray that you encourage us and strengthen us. And, Lord, we do pray that you have mercy upon this, this fallen world, this sinful world, the things that people get up to is horrific to consider, Lord, but we know that you long to redeem everyone, even as we learnt in 2 Peter, that you are waiting and you are patient because you don't want anyone to perish, but all to come to the knowledge of the truth. So, Lord, thank you for your mercy and grace and patience with us. Help us to do the same to the world around us and to love them greatly. For this we pray in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Thank you.